Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Contemplative Science Podcast. My name is Jamie, and as always, it is my pleasure to be joined by co-host Dr. Mark Miller. Mark, how are you, mate? Hey, James, how's it going? Uh, I'm great, and uh, I'm excited about today's episode because we get to talk about the brainy effects of meditation, which is right in my wheelhouse. I'm always excited when we can talk about um, meditating brains. So yeah, I'm excited. Indeed we are. Um, Today's guest, I'm pleased to announce, is Sarah Lazar. Sarah is an associate researcher in the psychiatry department at Massachusetts General Hospital and is an assistant professor in psychology at Harvard Medical School. I'm quoting now, the focus of her research is to elucidate the neural mechanisms underlying the beneficial effect of yoga and meditation, both in healthy individuals and clinical settings. Sarah, thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me. So to start, I want to just quote at you again. Um, You've said, whenever you engage in a behavior over and over again, this can lead to changes. That's neuroplasticity. Is it Mm -hmm. fair to say that that's the starting point for your work? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, the, the real starting point for my work was I started doing yoga and it had a profound impact on me. You know, I was calmer. I was more settled. People who were pissing me off were not pissing me off. I saw the world in a completely different way, <laughs> you know, and it was just really clear to me that my brain had changed. And it's like, okay, I, I need to understand this. So that was really what, what really got me excited initially. Awesome. That's interesting. What happened exactly? So, yeah, about a month after I started practicing yoga, you know, I was in a lab. And back then, I was still in a wet lab back then. And uh, I got back, uh, you know, something. I don't even remember what happened. But there was a woman in the lab at the time who she was just one of these people who like to be controversial and say things and push people's buttons. And, you know, she said something. And normally I would have gotten irritated and snapped at her. And I just laughed. (laughs) <laughs> you know, because I saw that, you know, I saw her for what she was and what she was doing. And it's just, it was a very, um, you know, I just, like I said, it's just a different way of seeing her. And, uh, you know, and then there was a couple other things like that. And it all happened pretty quickly soon after I started meditating. And I realized it had something to do with the, medita- with the, with the yoga, you know, because I just, and also I was feeling more calm and relaxed. And I could see this because I was being calm and centered that she was, you know, her words were just not landing the way they usually did so there was something about your lens that changed your reaction exactly yes yes so i bet, I think, I bet sorry i was gonna say i bet so much good research has happened because researchers have had a positive experience doing these things and they were like well i'm a researcher so i gotta know like what's actually going on exactly exactly i think a lot of people like i've met a lot of meditation researchers who said you know they practiced it and you know they knew it was really beneficial for them but you know, they were reluctant to study it. But then as soon as a couple of papers came out, they realized that, yeah, no, this is legitimate, that, you know, they completely jumped on the bandwagon because it just is so pernicially meaningful. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, we're going to talk today about changes that happen to the brain. You mm-hmm. kind of reference to the fact that you were like, hang on, something's different here. Um, but before we do, is there a minimum amount of meditation required to produce the changes we're going to talk about? Yeah, that's always the first question I always get. Um, so in terms of brain, we have not done that study. We need to do that study. But for instance, um, so, so we looked at both brain structure and brain function, and other people have as well. So the earliest that we have seen brain structure is after four weeks. So there have been one or two reports of brain changes after one or two weeks. Um, but those tend to be, those have not really been replicated yet. Um, in terms of brain structure, but brain function, it's really clear brain function can change even after, you know, a week of practice, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty, um, impressive. Um, but then in terms of, okay, so, but how much, cause people want to know, do I have to practice 40 minutes a day? Right. So no one's looked at that in terms of, okay, how many minutes per day you have to practice, but we have looked at that in terms of, um, behavior, you know, so there's been many studies where, um, people have only practiced say 10 or 20 minutes a day. And definitely you get benefits. We did one study where we randomized people to 40 minutes a day or 10 minutes a day. And, you know, definitely the people in the 10 minute per day group got better, but the 40 minute per day group got better than them. <laughs> you know, it was only significant in the t- 40 minutes per day. So it does seem like 10 minutes a day gives you some benefit, but 30 or 40 minutes a day is going to give you more benefit. Wow. Do you have any sense of where the plateau is? I'm interested in whether it's linear and 40 minutes a day produces four times the benefit. Yeah, it was a small study, so we can't go there yet. The other issue is that, you know, why do some people, 
you know, practice 40 minutes and some, even if you're told to practice 40 minutes, some people practice 40, some practice 30, some practice 20, some practice 10, some don't practice at all. And so, and there's probably all sorts of factors that are contributing to that. So there's a little bit of a chicken egg problem there. Especially when the type of, you might say, centeredness or calmness that's brought on by the practice is predictive of then sitting for longer anyway. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, cool. So some of our listeners, particularly our older listeners, I'll say, might be interested in hearing um, there are some significant cognitive effects when it comes to aging and brain function mm -hmm. and meditation. Um, you conducted a study in Boston mm -hmm. that made that point. Uh, can you tell us about that? Yeah. Um, so actually, we've done a couple of different studies that are relevant to aging. So the very first study we ever did, um, looking at brain structure, what we saw was that there were a couple of places in the brain where we didn't see any brain atrophy. And in particular, there's an area that's involved in high-level cognition and something called fluid intelligence, which is the formal name for um, IQ, that that was not aging, right? That the people with the 50-year-old meditators had the same size brain there as 25-year-olds. So it really looked like it somehow was preserving it. So then we did a follow-up study, because um, that first study was just people 25 to 50. And so then we did a follow-up study with people um, you know, older, like 45 to 70, and we gave them the standard IQ test. And what we saw was that, yeah, that IQ is preserved with age in the older meditators, right? Um, so those, those studies were really suggested that, yeah, meditation and yoga. So the study can say we also included yoga practitioners. And both the yoga and meditation practitioners did better than the controls. And they also had improved brain function. But both of those studies were cross-sectional, meaning as people who chose to do yoga and meditation. And so you never know, okay, well, maybe, you know, just people with better brain function, higher IQ are more likely to do meditation and yoga. So we just finished a study where we randomized people. So older people, 65 to 80, who had no prior yoga or meditation experience. And we randomized them to either meditation or crossword puzzles and Sudoku. And over the first eight weeks, both improved pretty similarly. There's a slight advantage to the meditation. But what was really cool is that then over, we followed them for two years. And at two years, the controls were back down to baseline and the meditators had actually continued to improve. Wow. So really, yeah, yeah. No, it really does suggest that, you know, and like, you know, we gave them the, the recordings, but there was no, you know, when we told them keep practicing, but there was no further support, but a lot of them were still continued practicing. And so, and so continued practice, they continue to accrue benefits. Wow. So interesting. And what were you doing for meditation here? I mean, because meditation is an umbrella clay or yep. concept so what was the what was the practice they were doing so for that study um it was mindfulness meditation it was a variation of mbsr you know it was eight weeks we didn't include yoga in that study um but it was and we mostly focused on on cognition you know so on attention and um you know studying attention that there was a little bit of stress reduction is there as well um and a little bit of open monitoring but the main practices were like body scans and breath awareness wow great Mm -hmm. um, so I want to talk now about gray matter. As a yeah. non-neuroscientist, I don't know what gray matter is. Um, yeah. So if you could explain what it is and then maybe how it changes, that'd be great. <laughs> right. Okay. So if you think of a neuron, it looks kind of sort of like a tree with lots and lots and lots of roots and lots and lots and lots of branches. Um, and then uh, you have the trunk. And so white matter is the trunk of the tree. And gray matter is the roots and the branches and where the roots of one tree interact with the branches of another tree, right? Very simplistic, <laughs> you know, but that's basically the idea. And so the gray matter, it's, um, <clears throat> so the whole outer shell of the brain, the cortex is gray matter. And it's all just where the, the cells are interacting with each other and sort of, um, and like basically where thinking is happening. Uh, you also have some parts of the brain buried deep underneath, so like the hippocampus and the patamen and um, uh, uh, you know amygdala. Those are the regions that people have heard of, I guess. Um, those are also gray matter, and those again, they're just the basically the, the 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 yeah the parts of the cells that where you really get all the the stuff happening. Um, and then the white matter, like I said, is just the long distance connection, so that you know, this part of the brain is talking to this part of the brain over here and it's talking to that part of the brain over there. So you just have these have long connections across the brain and from the brain down into periphery. And so all that is white matter because the white matter is basically just um, insulation around the, the long fibers. Right. And how does that change during meditation? And what's the significance of that change? Right. So both actually gray matter and white or white matter both change. So <clears throat> we'll talk about white matter first. That's a little easier. 
So the white matter is mostly fat. Um, and just as we get older, the quality of that fat starts, the fat starts to break down. Um, and so, uh, cause the insulation, what it's doing for those of who know electricity, it's, 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 it's helping the conduction of the electrical signal down the, the long uh, fibers of the, of the, of the nerves. Um, and so as it breaks down, the things don't move as smoothly and easily. You know, the, the message doesn't move as smoothly and easily down the nerves. Um, and so, uh, and that can be due to just, you know, accruing damage and bad diet and things like this. Um, and it seems like somehow meditation is useful in that it helps slow the breakdown of that white matter. And then, but in terms of gray matter, and so the, and so staying on white matter for a moment, that's important because as we get older, lots of times so we just, we get a little slower. Like it just, it, you know, we can figure things out, but it just takes us a little bit longer. And often that's due to the white matter breaking down. And so, um, and so because our white matter has more integrity, you know, we're, you know, we remain pretty sharp and also because being able to put two different ideas together requires them, you know, there's this idea in, in uh, neuroscience, you know, what fires together, wires together, right? And so if, you know, this over here and this over here, they're not firing at the same time because the white kind of matter connection between them is not good enough, they're not going to get connected. So it's harder to learn, you know, when, when the brain is a little bit slower. So, um, so that's why white matter is important for aging is because, you know, we can continue to learn, and you know we're we're still as sharp as when we were younger. So that's the white matter. So then the gray matter, like I said, it has to do with the nerve endings interacting with each other. And so, um, so for instance, like if there's something I don't know very much about, there just may be a few nerves interacting there, or, or um, not nerves, neurons. You know, neuron ends, you know, interacting there. But then, like as I learn more information, the idea is that there tends to be more and more neurons you know piling in, and, and there's more. Um, right? There's more information flow. And there's, it's sort of like a, you get a bit of a traffic jam, maybe, or maybe not a traffic jam, but like, you just, you know, more and more roads interacting, right? The way to think about it. And so those take up space. And so growing gray matter means there's just more going on there. Um, and sometimes it can be the more neurons or not neurons, but uh, the ends of the neurons, like more branches and roots. Um, but also there's all sorts of helper cells and blood vessels that the neurons require. And so the gray matter has all of that. It has the neurons, it has the helper cells, it has the blood vessels, and all of those contribute to improved cognitive functioning. And unfortunately, with humans, we can't really tease that apart easily. Um, but in, in like in rats, they've shown that all three of those improve. Like when you take a mat and rat and you know train it through a maze or some task or something like that, all three of those improve. Um, and so we think that we don't know which of those is improving with the meditation, but some combination of those three um, seems to be changing with the meditation. And then we're starting to show that then these changes in gray matter do have benefits, that they're related to improvements in cognition or changes in emotion regulation. Why would just attending to your body or attending to breath <laughs> or attending to attention have these long range, big, heavy impacts on cognition, generally speaking? Yeah. So there's like five answers to that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you really want right. to geek out? We can geek out. All yeah. right. So, so, um, so our mind tends to want, all right, so we'll just do the simple part, attention, right? Yeah. So a lot of times people refer to meditation as a form of attention training because you're sitting there, you're focusing on something, your mind starts to wander, you bring it back. Your mind starts to wander, you bring it back. Your mind starts to wander, you bring it back, yeah. right? So if nothing else, you're training sustained attention. And both we and others have data demonstrating that, yes, it's sustained attention improves, right? So that, that's good. But in order to do that, what you're really doing is you're improving your ability to monitor your mind. Right, so mind right. you know, starts to wonder, and so that's called meta meta awareness. Yeah, right, and that's a very important skill. That's part of fluid intelligence, right? Part of IQ right. is being able to think about your thinking and being able to you know evaluate your what's going on in your mind. So yeah. that's part of it. You're also strengthening that, and then um, uh, the other thing is because we tend to just habitually think about things things over and over and over and over again, and so when you really start to you know detach from that and sort of look at it from a distance, you start to realize that, yeah, a lot of what's going on in our mind is not very useful or very um, accurate sometimes even, you know, and you gain a different perspective on that. And that really helps tremendously with the emotion regulation. Um, also, a big part of it is is not so much that you're focusing on the breath, but you're doing it non-judgmentally, non-reactively. 
right? And so they tell you, okay, when things come up, because everyone's got emotional baggage that's going to come up, right? Or if nothing else is like, oh, that thing that happened earlier today and, you know, it's coming up and you're just going to be able to sit and look at it in a completely new different way. Um, and that is really, for the, in terms of the emotion regulation, incredibly important. You know, so it's not like, oh my God, this thing happened and blah, 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 blah. And you learn to sort of sit back and just see it as a story. Um, the way I like to think about it is, you know, when we're in the middle of it, you know, we can't solve our problems, but we, we turn to a friend and our friends, because they've got perspective on it. And so they can, yep. you know, and when we help a friend, you know, we've got perspective on them. And so we can help them because we've got perspective. So now what if we could get the same perspective on ourselves? And I feel like that's part of what meditation helps us do is it helps us gain some of that perspective. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then we become less reactive. And then, um, so that's like what, three or four ways already. And then another way that's really, really useful uh, that there's not a lot of data for this yet, but there's a lot of theory. There's a little bit of data for it though. It's something called prediction error. I don't know if you want, I guess, want to go into that or not, but there's the idea is that the brain is a prediction machine, right? Because it's constantly having to figure out what's coming next. Um, and we're going to just do a little thought experiment. That's okay for you. So imagine yeah. you're sitting in a cafe and you're waiting for a friend, right? And suddenly someone walks in and they have more or less the same build as your friend, maybe the same hair. And for a split second, you think you see your friend. But then you realize, oh, no, 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 it's not them, right? So, but for that split second, you could have sworn you saw your friend. And in fact, you did. Because what happens is that the brain, it actually takes about 150 milliseconds for light to come in, hit your eye, go to the back of the brain, get processed and figure out what you're actually looking at. And so the brain is continuously predicting what it's going to see. So now, like, if you just look around your room, like, your brain knows what your room looks like. And so your room is sort of preloaded into your brain. And so as you look around, it sort of knows and it preloads what it knows to be there. And so that way then... As you look, it then confirms, yep, 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 yep. So when you're looking for your friend, it sees your friend's face because you're looking for your friend's face. And then it realizes, nope, doesn't match, okay, and then shows you what the face actually looks like. Right? So your brain's actually doing this all the time. It does it for vision, but it also does it for thinking, for emotions, for mood, for all of it. Right? There's some really interesting ideas out there about how much of our experience is based on predictions. And one idea with meditation is that you're learning to break those predictions and to see things as they actually are and to, to make the, um, so you're not always work, you know, reacting on habit that you're, you're learning to see what, you know, wait that 150 milliseconds, see what's actually coming in before you respond. So it's a really, um, a really cool hypothesis. And all that comes from just watching the breath. Wow. It's a ton. It's a ton of stuff. <laughs> and I love that, you know, we, lots of people come to meditation with this misapprehension that you're supposed to have a quiet mind or steady attention. But actually, a lot of the benefit comes from watching attention move in the normal way that it does. Yes. And watching the mind make conceptual elaborations. And uh -huh. then you become metacognitively aware of how attention moves. So you're learning more about attention. You're getting some distance already from those processes. And you're starting to learn how you conceptually elaborate rather than just see what's actually there. And that's all just from watch the breath. If it moves, bring it back. Start again. It's amazing. Exactly. Exactly. Because of course the mind is going to move, right? And those emotions are going to come up. And can you just still sit, sit there? If nothing else is like, this is boring. I want to get up. Nope. I'm just going to sit here. Oh, I could be doing something else right now. Nope. I'm just going to sit here, right? Even just that amount of, you know, and working with that is tremendous. Yeah. There's, there's something to emphasize here. And I say this as the non-scientist. So maybe this comes with more of a shock to me. But if you were to sell a pill that could have the cognitive effects you've just described, and you said, well, there's no side effects. It makes you feel a little bit more chilled out. But also, there might be these cognitive benefits. You could sell that pill for a fortune. There would be a very, <laughs> there'd be a very high uptake on that pill. Yep. Right. And this is, yeah, again, a question we frequently get. Because so, I mean, we'll, we'll go there, right? So there is a lot of overlap between the effects of meditation and the effects of psych uh, psychedelics, right? Especially like the really, really, really deep meditation states. There's a lot of overlap between them. Right. And there's a lot of people who have taken psychedelics who say that they're enlightened and who feel like it's the same as meditation. And, and I know people who've done a lot of psychedelics and who've done a lot of meditation. They say, no, it's not. There is some overlap, but that the meditation gets you way deeper, way more effective, way more beneficial. Um, 
and you know, to say that there's nothing with you know psychedelics definitely have you know in the right context and whatever there is a use for psychedelics you know there's they're showing that really right now that's really effective for um, some forms of trauma um, you know when done under medical supervision um, but meditation it seems like it has a lot more benefits than that um, and so so yeah I mean if there was a pill then yeah but my sense is that. Because the thing is, it's part of it's the attention, but the important thing is also the non-reactivity, right? Because again, it's like, because the idea is that as your mind quiets down, the emotional baggage starts to come up, right? And you start to see the emotional stuff in a new way, because that's really the key to it. It's not so much that you're stabilizing attention, it's that you're starting to see experience in a new way. And so learning, that's the real part of it, is the learning how to see things in a new way. Why is it then that is, I mean, obviously meditation is increasingly popular and it's been becoming increasingly popular, but like this thing's free, it chills you out emotionally. You've just described in this conversation what happened to you in the context of your lab mate who was irritating. Yeah. Do you think that it, meditation, and I can't believe I'm saying this given how popular it's getting, but given the scale of the benefit it might have a PR problem. Like why are we not all doing this? Right. Well, yeah. I mean, well, why aren't we, right? Um, so, um, so for instance, so people with a history of trauma need to proceed with caution, right? And so, like, so I said, like your emotional baggage comes up. For most of us, emotional baggage not too bad. But some people have a lot of emotional baggage, and if they're not ready to deal with it, or you know, if there's just a lot, a lot, a lot, you know, it just can be it can be overwhelming. Um, that can definitely be part of it. Um, and also, uh, you know, people will say with schizophrenia or psychosis, these sorts of things, you know, again, they also need to sort of proceed with great caution. Um, but otherwise, yeah, there is no reason why most people couldn't practice 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes a day. And you know, that's really highly beneficial. And there's, you know, it's sort of like exercise, you know, as long as it's done, you know, you know, uh, thoughtfully, you know, it's, it's highly beneficial. I wonder then, why is it that people um, with, as you say, the baggage should proceed with caution? Well, just that, you know, to know that it's going to come up, you right, know, because and so, the, cause you can get re-traumatized again. Ah, because there's something about the way that the attention function, the tr attention training and the quietening of the mind, quote unquote, brings up residual trauma. Right. So for instance, one of the first times I started, I've been meditating for, I don't know, maybe six months, a year. And I was sitting there and all of a sudden, so back when I was in fourth grade, me and another girl on the playground got into a fight and I got sent to the principal's office and I was mortified. Like I was a good girl. I did not get sent to the principal's office, you know, whatever. And I was just like, my world was coming to an end. Right. But I was a good girl. I got good grades. You know, they just said, you know, don't do that again. And that, that was it. No one ever said anything about it ever again. Right. And I immediately buried that event and, you know, never spoke of it again. Right completely forgot about it like if you'd ever asked me you know up until that point have i ever been sent to the principal's office I'd be like no of course not but there i am sitting and meditating and all of a sudden boom i'm back in the principal's office my face was bright red and i was just dying <laughs> just like oh boy <laughs> you know and just because out of the blue it just got de-repressed right and so now that in terms of trauma that's pretty you know minor right but now imagine if there was something bigger right you know and all of a sudden i was you know you're not expecting it and boom there it is so that's why, you know, you just need to, you know, if you know you have some, you know, trauma history, you know, just to proceed, you know, know that it's going to get de-repressed, work with a mental health provider and just proceed with caution. I like, um, there's a big discussion happening today that I think is really valuable about window of tolerance and being able to have the metacognitive capability to know where your window of tolerance is. So don't know when you're overly aroused or under aroused and mm -hmm. that probably mindfulness is going to be most useful when we're in our window of tolerance so I hear you, you know, if you have big emotional trauma and you get triggered and then you're in the red immediately, that's a really challenging thing to probably meditate your way through. So then you've right. got to be careful about using attentional training programs like this on your own to deal with things where you're out in your red. Maybe better to talk with a healthcare provider or talk with a, um, some sort of support network in order to come back into your window of tolerance and then continue to practice maybe. Yeah. And I find that meditation and therapy work really well together because yeah. the mindfulness skills, because again, it gives you the metacognitive awareness, it gives you the non-judging and a little bit of the distance. And so, you know, and I've talked to a lot of therapists who meditate and who have clients who meditate and they say, yeah, like the, the two go together really, really well. But you definitely, I know a lot of people who they started meditating, 
baggage came up and then they went to therapy and, you know, and it was good because it's sort of, they're ripe for it. So the two really work well hand in hand together. And, you know, usually, you know, most people just need, you know, a little bit of time and then they work through it and then, you know, they're done with it. Um, but you can, yeah, just talking about, you know, because meditation is good. Therapy is good. The two together are fantastic. Um, something I don't want to skirt over is you said, you know, I thought that sentence was going to end. I've been meditating for, I thought you were going to say something like X number of years total. Ah. But you said six months a year. Um, just tell me a little bit about that. Is that a retreat situation? Sorry, wait, you said six months a year? Wait, uh, I'm, I'm yeah, did, did I, did I, um, I might've misheard. You said you meditate, you've been meditating for about six months a year. Oh, 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 no, 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 no. So, um, so I've been meditating for 25 years now. So, and, but I do go on retreat. So, um, I went on my first retreat in 2005, just a week long retreat. And then I did a week long retreat per year for about 10 years. Um, and then, uh, a lot of stuff was going on, you know, uh, with my family. <laughs> and so I kind of took a couple years off cause I just did, you know, whatever. Uh, but then actually in 2019, November, 2019, I did a six week retreat, which was fantastic. You know, and then of course then COVID. Um, and so then I've done home retreats since then. Uh, and I'm hoping to go on a, on a in-person retreat soon. So yeah, retreats are a lot of fun. I shouldn't say they're a lot of fun. Retreats are <laughs> transformational. <laughs> they can be fun. They can be gut wrenching. They can be, they're all over the place. It's, it's, it's a roller coaster. It can be a roller coaster, but sometimes it is just, it's just sweet. Um, but yeah, you, there's no two retreats are the same. Let's just put it that way. Um, so something I want to pick up on was, um, I, I just want to say first, I really appreciate the way that you're talking about meditation. Um, I think sometimes mindfulness can get taken out of context or attentional training can get taken out of context and then we forget all mm -hmm. of the metacognitive um, parts that are part of it and also the emotional part and the way that things are coming up and we're learning to manage them better. Mm -hmm. um, and I love also that you're bringing it back, um, you know, you're saying uh, like therapy and various forms of meditation fit like brick or brack. And I think probably traditionally you would want something like that where you're gonna be close to a teacher, you're gonna be close to a community. So, um, Another thing that I think is sometimes left out of the conversation that I know you are definitely keeping in the conversation is the relationship between morality and virtue and some of this meditative development. Um, you know, we hear, I think we're increasingly being reminded today that meditation grew up in a certain tradition and uh, it's maybe important to consider what that tradition was doing as a support framework for the meditative right. practices themselves. And part of that, of course, is virtue training, you know, trying to harm less or steal less or lie less because they right. help the mind, they support the mind in the sorts of endeavors that you're going to pursue in meditation. But mm -hmm. your research goes the other way, right? Starting to think about some of the ways that meditative training mm -hmm. can uh, feed back into right. more virtuous or more moral sort of perception. I'd love to hear more about that. Right. So this really comes into the metacognitive, metacognitive awareness and seeing our mind. Um, so I think most of us like to think that we are kind, virtuous person, people, and we are, we really truly are, but all of us occasionally have unkind thoughts. Um, as we've learned over the past few years about the Black Lives Matter, you know, and systemic racism, you know, many of us have done things that we didn't even think twice about, you know, like, you know, like there's like the microaggression, you know, against African Americans and whatnot, you know, and these little things that we've done that we just, we did, weren't even aware that we were doing. And I think that one thing that mindfulness does is because again, it helps us sort of step back and sort of see what goes through in our mind. And like, so there's like, there's the main, the, the I always like the big voice, right? There's like the voice that the narrator in our mind, right? That's like, okay, oh, I got to remember to go to the store today. And oh yeah, you know, I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to need some bread and some flour, you know, and, you know, butter and whatever. But then there's also kind of this quiet little voice in the back of the head that's sort of, you know, and sometimes it's not so quiet, you know, that's like, oh, I don't like her or, oh, oh, that person, he's such a jerk. Right. Or, oh, I can't do that. You know, and all these little, the little commentaries. Right. And normally like we don't even really pay, you know, so I mean, sometimes it's not even like a full sentence. It's just sort of, or even, even worse. Sometimes it's just sort of a feeling. Right. And I feel like most of us, at least when I start meditating and talking to my friends who start meditating, that as we start to meditate, we come tune into that voice more and more and more. Like we, we pay more attention to it. And that voice is not as always as kind as we think we are. <laughs> Right. And it does something, you know, like we often, some of our motives are perhaps not as kind as we think they are, or, um, 
you know, we do things that are perhaps a little bit morally gray. Um, and, oh, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. But if we had to say it's fine that many times, is it really fine? <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. And so and normally we just sort of brush that off and go past that. But with mindfulness, like you really start to tune into it and you realize, ooh, ooh, wait, hold on. My thoughts and my actions are perhaps not aligned with my, my thought of myself and with my morals, right? And, my, and so um, it really helps us clean up our act um, just because we become more aware of it. And we do it in this non-judgmental way. We realize that, okay, all of us do this. And okay, it's the social norm, but I don't want to do that anymore. So I think that's, that's a big part of it. Right. And without that increased awareness to kind of the background thoughts, the, oh, I don't like her or he's being an asshole. You can buy, quote unquote, the top down narrative of, oh, I'm a great, I'm a great person. And right. you sort of almost confirm that, right? Right. And I'm point. right, she's wrong. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And I think when we're playing that game without necessarily the attentive attention training, we can miss maybe or suppress a little bit that background noise. Exactly. Exactly. But again, but as you start to set back from your mind and sort of see it as just thoughts, you realize, wait, hold on, was I really right and she was wrong? Well, maybe there's something she said that was, you know, why is she? And also you, you start to develop more um, care for other people, right? And so it's like, okay, so why did she say that, right? Or, you know, why was he acting in that way? And so you really, and this is part of, you know, changing, you know, seeing the world in a new way. You know, I go back to that very first encounter with a, the woman who was pushing my buttons. I started thinking like, oh, well, so what, why, why does she act this way? You know, why does she feel the need to push people's buttons? Why does she feel the need to, you know, do the things that she does. Um, and so then, you know, that increases empathy, you know, as you start to understand like, oh, okay, well, maybe she's having a bad day and, oh, you know, she's going through a hard time or whatever, you know? And so, um, so there's, it's just, it, again, it's working sort of on multiple, multiple levels. Yeah. It's interesting because I think we've all had this experience in some form when you're really, really angry and upset and then you leave the situation and half an hour later, there's automatically more room for compassion for the other person. You haven't yeah. done anything beyond just changed the attention. And as the attention has changed, there's a corresponding emotional change. Yes. Um, I just want to pick you up on that then. So is the thing that makes potentially meditation something that makes you more act more morally or process information regarding ethics differently? Is it just a case of attuned awareness of your thoughts? Um a thoughts, possibly also your body, like our body, like, you know, so this idea that, you know, we know, you know, when we, we feel physically uncomfortable sometimes when we're uncomfortable, right? And so sometimes our subconscious figures these things out before we have it even in our mind. So it's also tuning into my body, like, okay, I'm feeling icky here. What's going on? I don't like this, right? There's kind of sometimes it's not even really clear, but we can tune into the body sometimes as well. Um, but yeah, so thoughts, body, um, and also just, you know, seeing the behavior, seeing our, our attention, seeing how our behavior and words impact other people. So we also tune into other people's emotions more, like, so their facial expressions, uh, you know, seeing how they react, these sorts of things. I yeah. think that's a general thread that's running through here, which is as soon as you drop the narrative that's so strong, mm -hmm. you become by definition more aware of the things that are actually happening. Um, exactly. In the context of the predictive brain too, I mean, you've just given an example where like you've literally perceived someone to be there who's not there. It's not that much of a leap to suggest you could be misinterpreting something as subtle as a facial expression if you're not paying active yes. attention. Exactly, exactly, exactly. And also, like I said, it's often this quiet little voice in the back of your head and you don't hear it because the main voice is blah, 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 right? And also the, the body sensations, we're not paying attention to it because we're paying attention to blah, 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 blah. So blah, 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 stops, you know, then of course you're going to hear the, the quiet little voice and of course you're going to notice all these little things in your body. So, yeah. Have yeah. you done any experiments on this yet? Is this up in the evidence realm at all? Or do you have any plans to, or any thoughts about how we could go about looking at some of these um, ways that mindfulness maybe helps with these priming effects? I wonder. Right. So we have not done anything with the um, with the prediction error and that sort of stuff, but there have been um, a handful of papers that, and showing that, yes, it seems that mindfulness decreases the strength of predictions that your mind makes that, you know, you, your brain becomes a little bit more open to possibilities, um, which is really cool. And then there's also a whole bunch of theory papers also discussing it in a couple different domains. Um, so, so so stay tuned on that one. 
actually, very interestingly, this is my research. Um, ah. I'm, I'm, I'm solidly in the predictive processing war, uh, realm and looking primarily at contemplative practice. So, oh, um, fantastic. Okay, cool. That's All right. My home base. Um, but actually, I meant about the ethics, about, oh, the ethics. about changing your, your, I don't know, where virtue is sort of emerging up and out of um, the metacognitive strengthening that happens in these sorts of meditative programs. Anything here? Um, there's not a lot. There's a couple small studies demonstrating that, yeah, there's a little bit of a shift, but the people, mostly the people only looked over the course of two months, right? And so how much of things are really going to change in two months? I mean, I think you start to become aware, but it's sort of one of those things that's probably going to take a little bit more time. But there are some studies, again, with long-term meditators versus controls showing that, yes, there's a little bit more virtue. Um, um, you know, and these sorts of things, but it, it's not, nothing just like solidly like yes. Um, but yeah. yeah, and it's also a little bit hard also because as you said, a lot of times people who do it in the context, you know, who continue to do it for several years, do it in the context of Buddhism. And, you know, when you're doing it in that context, you know, that a big part of Buddhist philosophy is, you know, do no harm, <laughs> you know, and you know, don't steal, don't, you know, and, you know, to watch your words. And so how much of it is just from the meditation versus how much is it also the philosophy? It's hard. It's going to be hard to t tear those apart. Yeah. It's interesting. I remember sitting in, on retreats once um, and it was outside and it was quite hot and there were lots of mosquitoes flying around during the day. And there was this one guy who got into a bit of an arm wrestle with uh, one of the teachers because he kept on Watching these things he was like yeah. it's more important that my meditation isn't interrupted and these guys i'm not having and the teacher was like no trust me on this one it's kind of the same package and the yeah. mosquitoes are a chat do you see that in do you see at least on the level of the brain that to be an interlinking between the ethics and the attention um not on the level of brain we're not there yet but I know one of my meditation teachers has said, if you're having trouble paying attention, clean up your ethics. <laughs> There's also a wonderful video. I don't know if you want to share it. It's called uh, The Fly and the Samurai. Have either of you seen this? No, no, no. no. Oh, it's wonderful. So it's this uh, samurai who's sitting there in meditation, right? <laughs> and then this fly comes. It's just a fly, not even a mosquito, but just a fly. And it's buzzing around. And he's like, you know, in, in this. So then he pulls out his sword and whoosh, fly is cut in half. But then the fly regenerates and now there's two flies. Um, <laughs> gone. He, this keeps happening. All of a sudden there's thousands of flies buzzing around, right? And of course the flies represent thoughts, right? And so he's just like, ah, ah, ah. So then he's just like, and so then he just sits through it. And he sort of basically he ignores the flies and he just focuses. And then that's when, you know, the flies turn into, um, petals of a, of a cherry tree yes. <laughs> and then he you know he wakes up and there's just one fly and it's just he's, you know it's you know symbolism for okay he's you know mastered his thoughts right so it's uh but that's the idea that yeah like if you can just you know don't let the you know so the mosquito bites you so what yeah you know, so yeah, there's a whole non-harming but there's also like okay so can you just live with you know that's how's that any different than you know a buzzy thought so the question now is what can listeners do today or at least start uh -huh. today to induce some of the physiological and behavioral brain changes that we've been talking about? Meditate. <laughs> yeah. Because that's actually, and this actually gets back to your question about the, the pill. Because mm. um, I think, you know, we all have this idea that, like, oh, you know, we want to be calmer and we want to, you know, we want these things that meditation gives, right? But I feel like we don't want to change our life. We want to go, you know, we want to keep going and like, you know, watching violent movies, for instance, or, you know, and, and we don't want to have to deal with changing how we interact with people, but we want all the benefits. It's like, no, the way you get the benefits is because you start to change your behavior and, you know, you change your relationship to behavior. And so, um, so the only way to do it is to start meditating and start to see what your own experience of, okay, well, so what is causing me, you know, that's really the question, right? It's like, okay, why do people meditate? It's because I'm unhappy. There's something I'm unhappy about. And so you, first of all, you have to figure out what's making you unhappy, why it's making you unhappy, and then what you can do to change. Because again, the external is not about the external world, it's about the internal world. How can I change my relationship to my world? And so it really requires changing inside. 
And so, and, you know, pills are not going to, well, maybe a pill could do that, but, um, but it requires, you know, going along with that and saying, okay, I'm, I'm really, I'm what, I'm willing and ready to see what's going on and to make those changes. There's something to be said here about the analogy of sunglasses. I, I don't know whether I've heard this or I've made this up and it doesn't quite work, but there's something around like the stimuli, the problem in the world exists in your field of vision. Uh -huh. So if the sun is too bright, you might complain about the sun, but it might be also that you've got like incredibly thin sunglasses on and really appropriate sunglasses are slightly darker. And uh -huh. there's something to be said here for the world is always going to produce some kind of irritating stimuli. The person in your, in your lab is metaphorically always knocking around. Right. Uh, I don't think anyone lives in an environment where the stimuli is always aligned with what they're wanting. Exactly. And, I just and so we that... have to, yeah, go ahead. No, and I just, I just wonder, I wonder in that context, what the most effective practice is to start getting more appropriate sunglasses on. Right. So for interpersonal conflicts, I highly recommend compassion practices, compassion for yourself, compassion for others, because what happens um, often issues we have with other people, we also have with ourselves, right? And that's psychology 101. <laughs> that's nothing to do with meditation. And so by having more compassion for those parts inside of ourself, we will just naturally start having more compassion for others. Like when we really start to see that, oh yeah, like again, like, okay, I can be a jerk sometimes too. We have more compassion for those people who are being jerks to us, right? It's like, oh yeah, been there, done that, right? So that's part of it. Um, but then also, as you start doing these compassion practices for other people, you start to, again, sort of see, you know, just your relationships, and you start to see them in a new way and you start to understand them in new ways. And so I highly recommend compassion practices if you're having a lot of interpersonal uh, difficulties. Um, so that's definitely part of it. And then um, also a big, 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 big part I find with meditation is continuously seeing the bigger picture, right? So again, it's like, okay, so now that person's not bothering me because I saw the bigger picture. I'm not just looking at it from my point of view, I'm also looking from her point of view. Right. And then like with Black Lives Matter, it's like, okay, looking and seeing like, okay, look at see how society has treated African Americans. How have I treated African Americans? Right. You know, so everyone wants to say, oh yeah, you know, it's those people over there. It's like, no, I do things that hurt African Americans. What can I do? You know, I can't change those other people. I can change me. Right. And so, um, uh, you know, so, um, where are we going there? Sorry, I got lost there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so, so, but so, so starting to change that. And so really it's about looking inside and seeing what's all going on inside and, and then willing to make those changes. Um, and how much, I mean, if I'm intimidated by the idea of meditation, but all this stuff sounds good, how long would you recommend starting for? If there's, I know a couple of people who said like, yeah, they sat down and did 40 minutes the first day and they've always done 40 minutes a day. They had no problem. They've been doing that 40 minutes a day every day for, you know, decades. Um, other people, they can, you know, five minutes is a challenge. <laughs> so I would say, and I know some people who say they just, you know, some days it's just one minute. Some days it's just, they say, okay, I'm going to meditate. Okay, that was it, <laughs> you know? um, but it's just the intention and just the momentary resettling, right? And so, but I think, you know, if you can do at least say five minutes, 10 minutes a day, you know, I think most of us can spare five or 10 minutes a day. Um, it can be, and, you know, you don't have to sit down and the whole thing. I mean, it can just be five minutes when you first wake up, and, you know, or five minutes at night before you go to bed, um, uh, you know, just the way to sort of clear your mind. And then if, you know, even just once a week, you could go to a class and do say 20, 30, 40 minutes in a class. I highly recommend that. You know, actually, when I first started, for the first several years, that's all I did was I just went to class once a week, and I did not practice during the week, and I benefited tremendously just going to class once a week. So, um, yeah, yeah. And again, it's a lot like exercise. So the more you do, the more you're going to benefit. Um, Sarah, before we go, where can everybody find you online? Yeah, definitely. I've got a website, um, and so if you do Lazar Lab, MGH, Harvard, you'll definitely find me. <laughs> Um, brilliant. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. Um, that was Sarah Lazar, and this has been the Contemplative Science Podcast. As always, thanks for listening in, and as always, we'll see you next week.